Michael, I don't think there's anybody in the world who doesn't know who you are. Um, I don't think there's anybody on this call who won't know who you are. But could you just give us a little bit of background to yourself, please? Well, I'm Michael Marmot. I'm director of the Institute of Health Equity at UCL. Uh, I have a medical degree from the University of Sydney, Australia, and a Master of Public Health and PhD from University of California, Berkeley and been working in London since 1976 and at UCL since uh, I've been professor at UCL since 1985 and working pretty much on health inequalities all of that time. Thank you, Michael. So as we go on today, I've, I've grouped the questions into themes around COVID and inequalities and how we bring in communities. But there was one question that that came up more than any other question. Um, and it was asked in, in various different ways, but ultimately the question is, what is the single change that you would make in society to have the biggest positive impact upon population health? It's a question, it won't surprise you to know that I've been asked before. And I commonly I've responded for example, with my English review in 2010, we had six domains of recommendations. And then people said, what's the one thing you would recommend? And I, being a bit naughty, said one thing, read my report. Uh, if I thought there was only one thing to do, I would have only made one recommendation. So if you're working in adult social care, uh, I'm not going to say forget what you do in your day job and focus on early child development. If you're working in early child development, I'm not going to say forget what you do and work on loneliness of older people or the crisis of employment in adult social care. Local government, the integrated care system, central government do a whole range of things. So if there's one thing, it would be to say, put equity of health and well-being at the heart of everything we do. So I suppose if we're talking about just one thing, if, if, there's, if you focus on one thing, then um, you're going to be focused on perhaps one cohort of the community or one element of people's health. But to get this right, it's seeing somebody as a whole person and populations as, as needing various different elements. And so the equity that you've just mentioned will allow us to, to see people as people and to address all kinds of issues because we're not, we're not linear as people. You know, our health issues are rarely linear. Uh, so there is a, a role on everything we've done. And your review from 2010 came up with a number of different recommendations. And I guess without looking at all of those recommendations, you run the risk of losing the potential impact if you just focus on one. And they're linked. So just briefly, the six domains were give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions. Number four, having enough money to lead a healthy life. Number five, healthy and sustainable places in which to live and work. And number six, taking a social determinist approach to prevention. And they're linked because if you haven't got enough money to lead a healthy life, that might be because of your employment conditions, because you're uh, in a job. I mean, we know a majority of people below the poverty line are in work. So you may have a job that doesn't pay you enough. And that means that the conditions in which your children are raised will be adverse. Um, so that affects early child development. Uh, it may then relate to children's education. And when it comes to prevention, well, if you can't afford to eat healthy food, uh, then there's no good giving people advice about healthy eating if they're too poor to buy healthy food. And on sustainable places in which to live and work, the fifth, fuel poverty. Fuel poverty is related to poverty as well as the quality of housing. So these things are very much linked. The cost of housing can be a determinant of poverty. So one reason for saying I'm not going to pick out one of the six 
is because all six tend to be interrelated. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. And and from your experience and from from the work you've been doing, has how has the pandemic broadened or reduced health inequalities? Has there been? I imagine it's broadened quite significantly. But has there been any anything about the pandemic that's that's reduced the inequality? No, you know, at the beginning, um, people said, oh, the pandemic will be the great leveler. And I thought, if you believe that, goodness knows, if you believe that, you'd probably believe there was no party in Downing Street. Um, you'd have to be incredibly credulous uh, to believe that. The, it was predictable from the beginning that the pandemic would expose the underlying inequalities and amplify them. And let me describe a graph for you. If you classify people by degree of deprivation, put them on an axis, you know, where they live by degree of deprivation on an axis, and what you see is the more deprived the area, the higher the mortality from COVID-19. It looks a very clear steep gradient. I was talking to a group, an oral, international oral health meeting. And so I put up a slide that had, again, deprivation along the x-axis, the left-hand end, the more deprived, and on the y-axis, some health outcome. And it looks exactly parallel with the COVID-19 mortality. I deliberately made the heading hard to read and then put a proper heading on it. It was dental caries in children. Shows the same, same gradient as COVID-19 mortality. Then I was talking to a group on primary prevention in cardiovascular disease in primary care. So I put up a third slide. Again, deprivation. On the y-axis, some health outcome. This time it was childhood obesity, identical social gradient. Well, COVID's caused by a virus. Dental caries is diet, poor oral hygiene, low fluoride levels is certainly not a virus. Childhood obesity, diet, exercise, stress related to deprivation, certainly not a virus. And they show identical social gradients. Now, in fact, the social gradient for COVID-19 is slightly steeper than the social gradient for all cause mortality. And we think that's probably related to employment in frontline occupations and living in overcrowded households, multi-generational households. So in terms of socioeconomic inequalities, the COVID-19 inequalities are slightly bigger. The big surprise of the COVID-19 data was the huge excess in different ethnic groups. Black British, Black Caribbean, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and to a lesser extent Indian, all have a big excess mortality compared to whites uh, of COVID-19 mortality. Much of that, but not all, is related to where people live, uh, population density, crowding, social deprivation, and the like and to other socioeconomic characteristics. But that was a big surprise because we'd been looking at um, health differences among ethnic groups and you see certain things, maternal mortality, mental illness, uh, but not others. So when the COVID-19 data came out, they were really dramatic. So I could say both from the point of view of socioeconomic inequalities and ethnic inequalities, the pandemic has exaggerated them, amplified them. And we had, we had a question actually, um, one from Nasmin and one from, from a couple of other people about how we overcome issues with racial disparities in health. Do you have any thoughts on, on what we can do? I mean, we, we've seen throughout um, that vaccine uptake is lower in different community groups. There was some targeted disinformation that targeted certain communities to try and put them off having the vaccine. Do you have any thoughts on, on how we can generally um, overcome those issues with, with racism or racial disparities within health? 
Well, my first reaction, I have to say, to seeing the COVID-19 mortality was structural racism. And I then asked myself, what do I mean by that? And how does that play out? Uh, and it relates to a debate that's gone on for a long time in the United States, less so here, which is the degree to which racial ethnic differences in health are related to socioeconomic differences or, and or is there something else going on, racism? On the first side, they're socioeconomic. For example, for every dollar that a white man earns, a black man earns 60 cents in the US. And so if you could reduce socioeconomic inequalities and you were colorblind, that would reduce racial ethnic differences um, because of the economic, social and economic disadvantage uh, associated with being of certain ethnicities in the US. That said, that's not all that's going on. One has to deal with the structural discrimination issues. We see it in Britain, most obviously in the police and the criminal justice system, but not exclusively. Uh, it's likely in the education system. Kids are more likely to be labeled difficult if they come from certain ethnic groups and excluded from school. Um, so there is evidence of structural racism in parts of the system. And it means that we've got to act both ways, both dealing with socioeconomic disadvantage and dealing with these issues of racism. When it comes to misinformation targeted at certain groups, I mean, misinformation is a huge problem. No one's got a simple answer to it. Um, but it's a huge problem that potentially damages the public good. Um, the vaccine hesitancy, which is um, damaging to the public good. I, I like the fact that the regional director for Europe of the World Health Organization, Hans Klug, said very clearly, vaccines, of course, wear masks in public places, saves lives. And we've had this total mixed garbled messaging from the government, you know, until yesterday, some ministers were saying, you can have a party, but don't kiss strangers, um, kiss loved ones, but don't have a party. I mean, goodness knows what the advice was supposed to be. Um, and now, well, work from home, but have parties or whatever it is. Uh, total mess, uh, lack of clear information. And if there's misinformation targeted at ethnic groups, that's unconscionable. I completely agree. I, I, I don't see it any less than a hate crime. It's it's ultimately to try and stop people from having a vaccine, which is to, to make people ill and, and potentially die. And, and how that can be seen as anything other than a hate crime, I think is um, disgraceful. Uh, and on the on the different information, you know, I think there's there is such inconsistent information coming out of government. I suppose it there's a the, the thing with masks. There's a role for for us to think about what we can do to keep other people safe, uh, rather than just the inconsistent messages that are coming out. I'm going to try and bring in one of our audience members to ask you a question around um, social policy. Uh, Naomi, I've just. I've just invited you in. Are you there to ask your question? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can. Go ahead. Brilliant. Thank you. So which social policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic has had the most positive and which has had the most detrimental effect on inequalities in the UK? Well, I mean, um, obviously, immunisation to the extent that it protects all of us, will protect disadvantaged groups as well as advantaged groups. So um, the fact that we made such an impressive and dramatic and quick start to the rollout of immunization will be the benefit 
uh, benefit to the whole community. The fact that we've slowed down uh, means that even that brilliant success hasn't continued. Uh, and then there's real pockets. So I would say immunization because it's benefited everybody. A, a close second would be the furlough scheme. Uh, I was shocked in a good way when the chancellor announced the furlough scheme. I thought, good heavens, we so used to the chancellor saying, austerity, we've got to get the public finances right, and implicitly saying, I couldn't care what damage it causes, um, because I have the number one priority of austerity. That was the subtext. He didn't say, I couldn't care less what damage it causes, but he said, austerity, austerity, austerity. And then we had a chancellor saying, whatever it takes, and whatever it takes included a furlough scheme. It wasn't perfect. The level of income support uh, in this country lagged behind that of many other European countries, but it was pretty good. On the negative side, uh, which did the most damage, the total failure of test, trace, and isolate. I mean, just wasting 38 billion pounds, um, just giving it out to private sector that had no expertise. Why not give it to public health to do? Why not give it to local public health to do? Um, they couldn't have done worse. They could certainly have done better. Um, it was a total failure and part of test, trace and isolate is isolate. And as the work we were doing in Greater Manchester, as our colleagues in Greater Manchester pointed out, it's all very well telling people to isolate. But if you don't have proper income support for people who aren't working, then poorer people won't isolate. It's all right for richer people working from home um, who are fairly isolated anyway, but for poorer people, who are dependent on going out to work. There's a real economic disincentive to participate in test, trace and isolate uh, because of the fear that if you isolate, your children will go hungry. So it was a terrible policy for inequalities. And actually, that's a question that's just come through in the Q&A on the chat from Martin Allen is, um, and, and you've answered it, Michael just there, but do you not think the pandemic and lockdown removed choice and opportunity from people who are, um, says not in poverty, I'm not quite sure if it means in poverty, and gave a good reality check uh, for them to understand poverty. So I think the question is, is asking just that, you know, did it remove choice for those people who aren't able to have the opportunities, the luxury of, of deciding whether to isolate or not? If you have to go to work in order to bring food in to feed your child, of course, you're going to put them first and you're going to focus on, on what they need. Um, just from your, your perspective, Michael, have you seen any really strong or good practice um, in other countries in the, in the pandemic response? Um, any other kind of any of the governments that are dealing with it really well? Anything else that you feel we could bring over to the UK? Well, let me continue with this theme of income support for people who can't work because of the pandemic. In Denmark, if you can't work, um, the unemployment benefit, I think, is 90% of your previous salary. Uh, in Germany, it's 60%. In this country, um, universal credit is about... 18% of median income. Um, well, you can see why uh, in Denmark, if you can't work, then it's not such a crisis for your family. Uh, remarkably, the United States in the first phase, remarkably under Trump, who mismanaged the pandemic um, outrageously, but the income support to families was actually quite generous. Unemploying, unemployment benefits in the US in that first bailout bill that was something like $2 trillion um, in 
when Trump was still president, actually increased the income of unemployed people. It was more generous. And we did it really very badly. And if you look at one of the arguments for not being too active in controlling the pandemic was, well, we've got to protect the economy. And it was a false argument because if you look at the data, I first saw it in a graph from the Financial Times, which is not known as business unfriendly as an outlet, um, but others have produced a similar graph. That if you look at the economic, the fall in GDP in 2020, and the mortality from COVID-19, the higher the mortality from COVID-19, the greater the hit to the economy. So to come back to Denmark, um, as an example, Denmark controlled the pandemic well and had a very small hit to the economy. Uh, and in fact, if you look at excess mortality, because there's some difficulty in making comparisons across countries in COVID-19. So the excess mortality approach is to look at how many deaths there were, let's say, in 2020, and how many would you have predicted based on the previous five years. And the excess mortality in the UK in the first part of 2020 was the highest of any rich country that has good data, the highest, worse than the US. In Denmark, excess mortality was negative, negative. They actually had a lower death rate during the pandemic than you would have predicted from the previous five years. In our Greater Manchester report, front page of The Guardian, when we launched our Greater Ma Build Back Fair in Greater Manchester on the 30th of June, front page of The Guardian was, the big story was England to Germany nil, and the bottom third of the page was jaw-dropping fall in life expectancy in poor areas. And life expectancy fall in the Northwest region, of which Greater Manchester is a part, was 1.6 years for men in 2020 and 1.2 years for women. It was stunning in England as a whole. It was something like 1.2 years for men and 0.9 years for women. But the fall in life expectancy in 2020 was jaw-dropping in Greater right. Manchester. I mean, fall, we're used to pre-2010, life expectancy improved about 0.25 years every year, one year every four years. So a fall of 1.6 years, my sums aren't very good, that's cancelled out six years of improvement. Um, that we, our failure to manage the pandemic cancelled out six years of improvement. And it wasn't a surprise. The Northwest had higher mortality than the English average pre-pandemic. And then during the pandemic, had 25% higher mortality from COVID-19 than the English average. So in a way, I'm, I'm saying what I said in response to the first question, that the pandemic exposed the underlying inequalities in society and amplified them. And do you think that gives us the, the impetus to do something, to do things differently? Or, or do you think that it will be that we'll move on, the government will move on, or, 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 or will, will, is there the chance that they'll take the, the such dramatic change that's come from the pandemic and actually do something around inequalities? Well, I've never been a gambler, so I'm not gonna make a prediction. I'm not gonna put money on it. But the reason I called, I've now published four reports in the last 12 months, each with the title, Build Back Fairer, not just Build Back Better, as President Biden's bill, Build Back Fairer. And I've said we do not, should not want to go back to the status quo. So the, my English report in February, February 2020, the Marmot Review 10 years on, 
documented the fact that over the decades since the original Marmot review in 2010, life expectancy had more or less stopped improving. I said it was improving one year every four years up to 2010, but that slowed dramatically after 2010. Inequalities between socioeconomic groups and regions increased and life expectancy for the most deprived 10% outside London went down. That's what we were doing pre-pandemic. And then, as I've been saying, the pandemic came and exposed and amplified those inequalities. So the last thing we should want to do is to reestablish the status quo, build back fairer. Yeah. And I've said publicly, if the government is serious about leveling up, we've provided a playbook for them. We've responding to the agenda. We've reviewed all the evidence working nationally and then with Greater Manchester and then with other regions around Britain of what they need to do to build back fairer, to level up. I should say I've got a comment piece that I think will be out next week. Um, I've drawn attention to the fact that when Germany incorporated Eastern Germany after the wall came down and they wanted to level up, they spent 2 trillion euros over 25 years. That's the equivalent of about 17 billion pounds a year. Is our government going to spend 17 billion pounds a year on leveling up? Well, you know, I don't think it's only about money, but you can't get away with spending money. I mean, the uh, all the work we've been doing with the Northwest region, Northeast region, the more deprived the area, the greater the reduction in funding to local government. So services have been stripped away in a most inequitable way. If you're going to level up, you've got to reverse some of that. Putting a bit of money into a high-speed rail link won't do it. Absolutely. Um, and that brings us really nicely onto another question from the audience. So I'm going to bring in uh, Dana um, to ask uh, to ask their question. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I guess part of my question was answered already in, in the previous comparison between Denmark and England, but I guess as a PhD student in urban inequalities, my question is about um, kind of this historic perspective of uh, the trends in health inequalities and whether you know well, there have been times in history where actually this gap between uh, the higher socioeconomic groups and lower have been reduced, or maybe there have been some countries where you know that health inequalities are reducing, uh, because it seems that you know, this has been an agenda for such a long time, uh, as I go now back in the literature, and there definitely have been efforts uh, from different levels of institutions and, and governments to do something about it. But yeah, do you have some insights and maybe uh, yeah, some examples of where actually um, there have been policies implemented that uh, have been effective in, in reducing health inequalities? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, let's start with infant and child mortality. We've done it. Most countries have done it. If you look at the gap in absolute terms, and I, I emphasize absolute terms, the gap in infant mortality between poor and rich in the 1900s, let's say around 1900, the gap was probably 150 per thousand live births. We were talking about an infant mortality of 100 per thousand live births in the better off group and 250 per thousand in the worst off. And then roll forward to 2020, and we're talking about three, 2.5 per thousand versus 5.5. That's a gap of three 
wow, we did it. We improved social conditions for everybody. It's worrying that there's a hint that the inequalities in, in infant mortality in absolute terms are starting to increase again. And you might say, well, look, the difference of one death per thousand live births, I mean, it's a tragedy to the family to which it happens, but in public health, you might say it's not enormous. But if you think of infant mortality as an indicator of other things, it's the, an extreme indicator of other aspects of health of children, then the fact that there's some increase in inequality is worrying. You could say, okay, yeah, well, everybody benefited and the differences, of course, infant mortality is related to squalor and deprivation. Um, what about adult mortality? Well, there's even evidence in the UK, um, colleagues from Liverpool looked at the gap in life expectancy between in England between the most deprived 20% of local areas and the rest. And they said the new Labour government elected in 1997 had as an aim to reduce health inequalities. It took a while to formulate policy to start implementing them and so on. But from around 2002, for the next 10 years, the gap between the most deprived 20% of local areas and the rest got narrower in life expectancy. Then the Conservative-led coalition government ditched New Labour's policies. And starting around 2012, the gap started to increase again. So it looked like even within this country for adult mortality, you could reduce and increase in a relatively short period of time. The other kind of evidence, if we look at the countries that uh, have sizable indigenous populations, let's take New Zealand. I think about 15% of the population of New Zealand is Maori. The gap between in life expectancy between the Maori and the non-Maori population has got smaller. They did it. And a lot of that, as I was saying about ethnic differences in this country, a lot of that is socioeconomic, not all of it. Some of it is to do with racism, but the gap got smaller. It's really quite impressive. And the general message is that we should not accept that the level of inequalities that we have is somehow a fixed property of society. We can do something about it. Policies can make it worse, can increase inequalities, and policies can make it better. I mean, I thought whenever it was about six weeks ago, when the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Minister of Finance, took the decision to take a thousand pounds a year away from universal credit to cancel the upgrade. And the estimate was about 300,000 children extra would be put into poverty. And I thought, wow, if he can do that between Wednesday and Thursday, maybe between Thursday and Friday, he could take 500,000 children out of poverty. It shows how powerful government policy can be. Now, you won't see the impact on health inequalities in the short term, but all the evidence we have suggests you'd see a real impact in the longer term if you reduce child poverty. And it could be done quickly, it could be done overnight. He increased it overnight. And, and recently, um, touching on that, obviously, we've seen government move away from talking about inequalities and and use different language. What, what do you think is the reluctance, Michael, in, in that term? Why is it that government are so anti talking about inequality and, and talking about it as what it is? I mean, I think the first thing to say is they would not have changed the name from inequalities to disparities 
through absent-mindedness. They must have had a reason, uh, and I wasn't party to these discussions, but I did say, um, talking to government ministers, that we've got a minister for equality. The opposite to equality is not disparity, it's inequality. Um, and it put me in mind of two things. One is, uh, in my research in this country, particularly in the Whitehall studies of British civil servants, I got a lot of research support from the US National Institutes of Health, uh, which always, I mean, it was very welcome, but it also slightly amused me that the US government was supporting my health research on British government workers. But, um, and I was at a meeting, in fact, in France, um, with the ex-head of the National Institutes of Health, and not a man I knew, and I had no reason to imagine that he knew about my work. And he said to me privately, I was really envious that you could talk about inequalities. In the US, we were only allowed to speak of disparities for political reasons. So when suddenly disparities came up instead of inequalities, I thought, well, now we are back in where the US was, but they weren't allowed to talk about inequalities, only disparities. And we know that in the 1980s, um, the way the government dealt with health inequalities was to edit it out, to change the language. So if you don't, you know, if you're not allowed to, uh, I mean, Ken Clark, who now seems like a hero of the Conservative Party because he spoke out about remaining in Europe and he's relatively liberal and so on. When he was Secretary of State for Health, he said, why do we consider continue with this Edwardian notion of class, of social class. Let's get rid of it. We don't need to talk about social inequalities anymore. So it, it does look like it's consistent with a particular political perspective. And I would argue, let's continue the tradition of talking about inequalities. You notice I'm director of the Institute of Health Equity, not Equality. Um, because we think there's an element of social justice in putting right avoidable health inequalities. Let's continue with the language, but let's get politicians from across the political spectrum engaged with this. It should be in the interest of all of us to have a society where avoidable inequalities in health are reduced to the extent possible. And actually the point about equity and equality is a really interesting one. And I think it shows how far we've moved on, on not just giving people the same chances, but making sure the conditions at the very beginning mean that everybody can achieve the same outcomes. Um, and I think that that's really, for me, that that's a really important change and, and hopefully we'll move, we'll move forward towards that uh, change. Um, are there any differences in how we think about inequality uh, or inequalities at the moment? Are there recent changes in current thinking or I guess the pandemic's shown us a lot of um a lot of issues that are going on but is there any systemic thinking that might be different around health inequalities now well putting aside this linguistic change for the moment which i said i think is significant um i'm delighted that there's so much discussion about the issue now um we've been we the institute of health equity we did our report for greater manchester and are still working with Manchester. We're working with Cheshire and Merseyside, with Lancashire. We've got a health equity commission in Lancashire and South Cumbria. And North Cumbria said, what about us? We want to join, don't exclude us. So now it's Lancashire and Cumbria. Um, we're working with uh, the East London Foundation Trust. Luton said they wanted to be a Marmot city. Coventry was a Marmot city from 2010. So there's real discussion, interest all around the country and a real thirst for an understanding of what can be done to change them. And that's new, that really is. Uh, I've never seen it like this before. So on the one hand, we've got these big inequalities in health that we haven't solved. Uh, on the other hand, 
there are people all around the country. I I would be surprised if there's one of the new integrated care system ICSs that's saying inequalities aren't part of our focus. That would surprise me because all the ones that have approached us have had inequality front and center of what they're trying to deal with. So there's a huge amount of interest. And then we were approached by legal in general. I don't know if they're the biggest financial institution in the country, but they have three trillion pounds under investment, pretty big. And they said, we want to work with you. We want to make reduction of health inequalities part of our agenda as a caring business. I've just never seen this before. I mean, so yeah, there might be some backsliding from the center in terms of language. Um, and I don't know, we'll have to see what the approaches are. Uh, but there's so much interest around the country. It's really encouraging. And obviously, tackling health inequalities doesn't just sit with government. So the more people that we can get involved in, in how to address and how to make things better for people through private equity or whatever it might be, um, then absolutely all the better. Um, I'm going to try and bring in Karen Bolland to ask a question around communities. Now, Karen hasn't um, confirmed that she's, she's around and happy to talk, so I'll give it a second. And if she isn't able to come, ah, she's there. I'm here, yeah. So uh, I'm asking this on behalf of small community organisations that actually work with a health watch, but what can we do in practical steps at the community level that's going to make some difference around inequalities. I think people are doing it already. Maybe they don't use that language, but I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about suggestions from Michael about what we could do. Well, you, a, the, a theme running through all our work with cities and regions, communities, is the question, a question running through all our work, is the question, is your question, uh, how much do you need national policy to change and how much can be done at local community regional level? And I've, I haven't got a clear answer to that question. But what I can say is we tried to have a look at what was going on in Coventry because they declared themselves a Marmot city pretty early. And we don't have a PACA evaluation. This wasn't a randomized controlled trial. Um, but uh, it does look like several indicators are moving in the right direction. They tried in Coventry to get people to sign, employers to sign up to a living wage and have made progress. They put effort into reducing the proportion of young people not in employment, education, or training, and they've made progress. And in fact, one of the potential benefits of that progress was a reduction in violent disturbances and violent crime. Um, they did get some improvement in early child development, but there was some improvement nationally. It's not sure Coventry, it's not clear whether Coventry did better than the national level. But in other words, if you, what Coventry did, if you take my six domains of recommendations, which I mentioned early, uh, earlier, you can take action on some, if not all of them. I mean, early child development. We pointed out um, in Greater Manchester that children eligible for free school meals were doing poorly on early child development. Now, that's true nationally. Poor kids have a, in general, lower level of early child development than the average. That's true nationally. But the poor kids in Manchester were doing worse than poor kids nationally. And in Manchester, they closed that gap in three years. In Hackney and Tower Hamlets, the poor kids, of course, were doing worse than the average on early child development. They nearly closed the gap with the average, not for poor kids, with the English average. And I looked at this and said, what did you do? And I'm not quite clear what they did. Um, I got different answers. 
from the teachers at the looking at the end of reception, they said we focused on the problem. Um, and there is an argument that if you've got a few kids eligible for free school meals in a generally fairly rich, comfortable area, they do rather badly because you know they're exceptions, they feel like they're excluded. If you've got a lot of poor kids, then your job is focusing on the poor kids because that's your, that's why you get out of bed in the morning. And that might be one argument. Um, people from the Bangladeshi community in East London said, we did it. Uh, we look after our kids. And there is some evidence that poor white kids do worse in school than poor Bangladeshi kids. So there may be an ethnic difference. Either way, it does suggest that you can take action locally that breaks the link between deprivation and poor outcomes. And I think that principle of breaking the link between deprivation and poor outcomes uh, applies across the spectrum of the recommendations that I've been making. It's fascinating stuff. It's, it's scary stuff. Um, Michael, I'm going to bring in uh, another uh, attendee, um, another audience member, Vernon, to ask a question about systems thinking. Uh, I'm quite conscious of time, so I'll give it to other people rather than to me. Vernon, are you? Are you there? Over to you, Vernon. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, we can. Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Uh, so my name is Vernon Kale. I'm a PhD candidate at Erasmus MC in the Netherlands. And my topic is concerning uh, systems thinking to understanding uh, social inequalities in health. And I wanted to ask, oh, what are your thoughts on uh, applying systems thinking? And like, where do you see that in the future um, in, in terms of it? It's, it's uh, uh, seems to be a complementary to more traditional approaches. Um, and I was curious to hear uh, where the future of that going, addressing inequalities in health. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In, I mean in, in, in our global, in our global if somebody could mute, yeah. In our global um, commissions, um, in the one we just did for the Eastern Mediterranean region of the World Health Organization, or the one we did for the Pan American Health Organization in the Americas, the global commission that I was involved in on social determinants of health, we talk about structural drivers, um, macroeconomic determinants, environmental determinants. In the case of uh, the EMRO, Eastern Mediterranean Commission, we talked about conflict and its consequences. So in other words, we're not just looking at the conditions of daily life. We are looking at those, but we're looking at the drivers of those conditions. So that's the first thing. The second is, as I said, in relation I think was my answer to the first question about is there one thing? And I said, they're all interrelated. My six domains in the English review are interrelated um, and understanding that. And it relates to a rather naive, uh, I'm not, sorry, I'm not for one moment saying you're naive. It relates to a rather naive approach to saying, well, we don't understand the causes because we've got to, uh, look at determinant A controlling for B, C, D, E, and F, so we can understand if A is really important. And I've had many discussions like that. Whereas if you've got a more systematic approach, you realize that that traditional econometric model or multiple regression model is not what we need. We're not trying to isolate the effect of A from B, C, D, and E. We're trying to understand how the system works. And then when it comes to taking action, we had um, a listening session in Lancashire and Cumbria earlier this week. And one of the things that came through very clearly from this listening session was we don't work together very well. We, we've got isolated pots of money um, the silo problem, 
and we don't work together very well. We certainly see it in central government, but here were people from local and regional government saying the same thing. And it's clear that just as we need systems thinking in understanding causation, we need more systematic systems thinking in how we solve it. And if you say, here's a pot of money for adult social care, and here's a pot of money for the health service, and here's a pot, pot of money for some aspect of local government, and so on, uh, without joining up and realizing that we need to cross those turf boundaries uh, to get meaningful action, it's going to be much harder uh, to make real progress. And any, any progress that comes without thinking of it from a systemic point is, is very short term and leads back to problems later on. Um, I'm really conscious of time. Uh, so apologies to, to people. We, we haven't had a chance to go through all the questions. We have a number of questions about specific points around climate change, um, addiction, serious violence, etc. Um, we've only got four minutes. I'm actually going to ask you a, a, a nice question, Michael, to close. Uh, a question from Karen around what do you consider to be your personal career highlight? That's probably the biggest question of all of them, possibly. Well, I don't tend to think that way. Um, <laughs> I don't spend a lot of time thinking about my highlights. I spend more time thinking about the task ahead of what we've got to do. Um, but uh, I mean, I enjoyed enormously uh, my time as more or less a full-time researcher. And, uh, and yes, I enjoyed being recognized, you know, whether it's citation indices or whatever it is. Um, so I enjoyed that enormously. And then, which was a great challenge, um, and particularly the first time I did it was the World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which I chaired. And it was an enormous learning exercise for me. How do we take the best research that we've got globally and change it into policy and recommendations for practice? Wow. And the process working with these wonderful set of commissioners, working with governments, working with the World Health Organization. It was a major shift of focus. Yeah, of course, it was a highlight. But you notice the way I describe it is as a learning opportunity and a challenge. Um, and what I, I learned and got personally from working with all these brilliant people. Uh, and so that, in a way, set the next phase. So the first phase was being more or less a full-time researcher. And if you asked me then what was the best highlight, it was, I don't know, publishing a paper in The Lancet. Um, and if you said, so what? I'd say, so I'll publish another paper in The Lancet. Do you know the um, one thing always, you always say more research is needed. Now, um, if you say, so what? I say, maybe we'll get some action on some of our reports. So publishing the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health in 2008, and everything that's happened since for me uh, has been a follow on from that. The English Review, the Review in Europe, the Review in the Americas, the Eastern Mediterranean. In the United States, they're talking the language of social determinants of health all the time. That came from our commission. Um, that's where it started. Uh, people don't know that, but that's okay. As one of our US commissioners, Bill Feige, said, it's amazing what you can achieve if you don't care who gets the credit. So for me, a highlight is having public health and other people in the US talk about social determinants of health to me and having no idea that I had anything to do with it. Wow, that's something of a highlight. That is fabulous. And I think, um, you know, everything you've just talked about, Michael, I think it's, it's very clear that the work that you've done has left such a long term legacy and will continue to make the world a better place for people. Because talking about things, you know, people are championing reduction of inequalities and championing new ways of work. And, and I think you're being very humble 
with your um, your career highlights and the difference that you've made. And, and I really hope that you you know you, you are able to recognise the the significant contribution and difference that you've made. Um, I'm also very sorry because we've run out of time. And as we just got started, we just got started. As Susan said, it would have been marvellous to have two hours. I, I think we could have done this for all day. Um, so this session has been recorded. It will be on our website for people to access in a couple of weeks. It'll be available to members first. Uh, I'm also going to take away the questions that came in. I'm going to take them back into our SPH and see whether we can do any pieces of work around some of the questions you've raised because they're clearly re of relevance to members of the public. And um, perhaps we can persuade Michael to come back and talk to us again at some point in the new year, and we can take some more of the questions. There's lots of thank yous in the chat, Michael. I don't know if you can see them, but there's lots and lots of thank yous and appreciation for your time. So um, thank you so much to you for giving up your time. Thank you to everybody for submitting the questions and for joining us today. Um, and have a really marvellous question, uh, marvellous question, marvellous Christmas. Um, stay safe. Follow the guidelines that keep people safe, regardless of whether the guidance that's coming out is, is relatively inconsistent. And um, as, as Jules just said, you are an inspiration, Michael. So thank mm -hmm. you uh, very, very much, everyone. Have a really lovely rest of your Thursday. And thank you. It'd be my pleasure to come back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.